conferencia sobre el reconocido caso de Estonia, experiencia de un país líder en gobierno digital. Para presentarla recibamos con un fuerte aplauso a Hannes Astor, subdirector del gobierno digital del gobierno de Estonia. between you and the lunch break, so I try to be fast. Um, my name is Hannes Astok. I'm coming from a tiny, small country, Estonia, and um, I have been working for the government in various positions for many years, starting for working with Estonia and the second largest municipality, Tartu, uh, many years ago, and also being a member of Estonian parliament. And I will explain a little bit what, how we use e-government tools in Estonia and how citizens and businesses can benefit from all this e-government approach, what is very hot topic also here in Panama, and how the e-government can help change the lifestyle of a country, the lifestyle of a government, lifestyle of a businesses and citizens. Estonia is a very small country in far, far north. So this is a map of Europe, and even Europe is far away from Panama, Estonia is much more far away. So don't worry, you will learn about Estonia soon more and more. Um, Estonia is a really tiny country. We have only 1.2 million people living where there is like 45,000 square kilometers. So it's like half the size of Panama by territory and three times less people than in Panama. But, and we do not have canal. So, um, uh, and the... The organization I'm presenting is eGovernance Academy, what is a non-profit, non-governmental organization, and it was established 15 years ago to assist other governments to learn more about digital Estonia and um, uh, on, uh, assist other governments to make the transition. So during these 15 years we have been assisted more than 50 governments uh, globally to uh, start the digital transformation and uh, and learn more about Estonia, so we are sharing the best Estonian, but also very much also from other countries, best international experience. And we are a small, small uh, team of 25 persons, but also we are using more than 100 experts globally. Now to a topic. If you are talking about e-government, actually we need to discuss about e-governance. And e-governance consists of two key parts. It's about Government, what is administration, services, software, you know, this kind of hardcore part. And there is another part, what is more soft part, what is democracy. And democracy is an important part of each and every government also, and the democratic procedures would be changed also very much with help of uh, newest technologies. So we need to think about it also, how we implement um, technology in the election processes, in participation and other democratic processes and how we can benefit in those processes from modern ICT, how we can engage more citizens through, through, through the new tools of ICT. So altogether, we can call it e-governance. There are various elements in the e-government or e-governance. Usually, when we are discussing about e-government, we are concentrating too much to the technical or, let's say, digital elements. So you can see them in right corner, right column, there are digital databases, there are interoperability, digital identity, digital security, uh, and other solutions. And we usually thinking on this is the e-government where we need to concentrate. This is partly true. But more we need to concentrate also to the so-called analog elements, what are very much connected to the process, but not technical at all. It's a legislation and regulation. It is about um, sustainable organization, change management, and last but not least also well, about the polit political will. So only if those two parts or two sets of elements are balanced, only in uh, uh, 
uh, if you are having approaching this kind of balance, we can be successful by getting results from e-government. Okay, what is the bottleneck? The actual situation, what you see in most of the countries, is that there are government offices who are owning the data, and if the citizen or businessman likes to get the service, what is usual in the format of whatever certificate or access to the services, they need to visit one office, another office, third office to collect the certificate, put them to the file and submit it to the fourth office. Many governments are um, providing already um, a, um, a service delivery model, what we can call one-stop shop. So basically, you as a businessman or citizen must visit only one office and the government official collecting the data from other offices instead you. This is definitely, for you as a consumer, it's much better than visiting all those offices by yourself. In Estonia, well, this really small country, we have been thinking that it's too much for us also. There's too many officials all involved in the process and it's too slow a process to be really efficient. So the idea is that how we can modernize and digitize the processes in a way that the citizen or businessman can directly interact with the data connected to him and get the services immediately. And, uh, for this, uh, to, to, to reach the results in this way, we need to have a strong digital identity for the citizen or businessman. We need to have secure data exchange, and we need to have a data in digital format and online. So let's take a look. What, is the benefit? what are the benefits? We have measured in Estonia that if you register a company, a new company online, takes like 30 minutes, sometimes even less. If you do it offline, by visiting all necessary offices, collecting all papers, submitting them, it takes like more than one working day. It's a big saving. It's a big saving. Also, if company need to submit the VAT declaration, what most of the companies must do uh, each month, if you do it online, it takes like seven minutes. If you are doing it offline, by going somewhere, printing papers out, takes you like more than more than hour, usually even more. And so on and so on. So you can really calculate the savings not only for the government, but also for the citizens and for the businesses. And businesses usually have a heavy burden of whatever reporting to a government. You need to report to the statistics, you need to report to the tax office, you need to report to the custom office, you need to report to the social security office. And usually all those reports are pretty similar, but you need to create them, submit them to the various offices, either offline or online. And it's, it's necessary, but if it's not organized properly, it's a heavy burden. This is one of the first pictures about Estonians, made 150 years ago. It's Estonian family communicating. Wife and husband are you know, talking to each other intensively. It's, you know, Estonians are what, not very tolerant. And uh, in this picture, yeah, family is having dinner and having a nice chat over a dinner table. Um, 150 years has gone, and not that much has changed. Because <laughs> it is uh, like a remake of one of the Estonian artists about this picture. And you can see that uh, now the family is communicating through computers, probably chatting in Skype or WhatsApp, or, or uh, maybe they chatting with their children who are spread globally, globally, but maybe they are communicating with the government also. No idea, but not that much has changed. So <clears throat> now coming to the key digital elements of the Estonian government, I'd like to go through real uh, quickly the key elements and then I show what kind of services that we can achieve. First of all, digital databases. And the data should be online. If the data is in paper format, like in this picture, computers do not understand it. So one of the key elements is that we need to collect the data in digital format, capture it in digital format, save it in the digital format, 
and share it in the digital format. Only in this way we can provide efficient online services. Also we need to have a secure governmental data exchange, sometimes called also interoperability solution. Because only if a government office is starting to change the data between uh, uh, themselves, but also with other institutions like companies in some cases and citizens, we can provide real digital online services. And this, the data exchange should be organized somehow. In this picture, it's uh, the red dots are, uh, green dots are Estonian government institutions, and the uh, black lines are connections between them for the data exchange. And if we allow them to exchange the data in this manner, uh, that each and every of them talking separately with other institutions, we ending up in the mess or in the picture, what we call spaghetti connections picture. So, uh, so this means that we need to have uh, organized data exchange also. And in Estonia, we use the solution what we call secure ex data exchange X-road or cross-road, what allows all government institutions to exchange data securely and properly. And currently, thanks to this solution, we have already more than 1,500 digital services available from the government or inside the government. And there is more than 350 million digital data transactions each and every year. And this is a picture of the system. I don't want to stop on it. You can get it later as a slide if you're interested about technology. And, last but not least, you need to have a strong digital identity. Already, almost uh, yeah, 25 years ago, Peter Steiner made this cartoon in, uh, in the magazine New Yorker. And I think he was very smart already 25 years ago, because already in those years, even most of them didn't think about it, there was a question, who is at the other side of the line if you are communicating through internet with somebody? And this question is coming more critical to all, all governments, but also businesses, because you know, need to know who is your client. If you are just selling a bottle of water through internet, you don't care who is your client. But if you are already sending, se selling more complicated goods, or in the case of government, providing services for the citizens, you definitely must know who is at the other, other end of a communication channel, usually internet. So that's why we need to develop digital identity. We started already 15 years ago now, and the issuing for each and every Estonian the uh, ID card with a chip. So this means that it, the card will provide for each and every Estonian the physical identity. You can travel with this card inside the European Union, but it also provides for each and every Estonian digital identity and opportunity to provide digital signatures. So now the rollout is done, all Estonians are covered with a card, and we can see already that during this uh, 15 years period, um, Estonians have made more than half a billion digital identification to various systems and provided 356 million digital signatures. And this is not machine-to-machine -machine digital signatures. This is what citizens have provided themselves. And the beauty of the game is that the smallest part of the digital signatures are provided in the communication with the government. Most of the digital signatures are provided for the business transactions, for the, to sign the bank transactions, or just sign the ordinary contracts. Me, as Hannes Astok, with my... Uh, uh, telecom operator or companies between each other. So the ecosystem is open for all participants, businesses, citizens, and government. Government has developed it, but all participants can use it. And this is the beauty how, to, how the Estonian society in general, not only government, has moved towards, towards the a digital, fully digital society. So we are using digital ID card, what allows us to get access to the government services, but based on my digital identity number, I get access also to many uh, private services, like banks, telecoms, energy, or, or any other who is accepting the credentials from the government. And as a next step, we already switched to the mobile ID. 
each Estonian, like each Panamanian, has a mobile phone. So why are we asking citizens to uh, use only a computer for the digital identification purposes? So we transfer a similar type of digital certificate from the chip card to the mobile phone SIM card. And now all those people who love to, like to have a mobile, use mobile, uh, mobile phone as an identification tool can do it. It's also supported by the government, so it's strong digital identity, highest level what, what could be um, <coughs> achieved. And this means that Estonians can sign with help of their mobile phones, also uh, do all digital transactions, sign documents, go for a voting, uh, communicate with the government, sign banking transactions, or whatever more. So currently already, there are more than 100,000 Estonians are using this solution, and as a next step from the ID card, it's really convenient and much better, with much better user interface, and all those who are switch, has switched to a, um, a mobile phone based mobile ID are like heavy users of a digital service. Well, what is the efficiency from those digital signatures? We have made a very rough calculation that by using digital signature you can save 20 minutes. Because you don't need to print out the contract, you need to, don't need to sign it, uh, put it to the envelope, find the stamp, find the mailbox and send it somewhere. Imagine about younger generation. Can you imagine that your kids who are like 15, do they understand at all what is envelope, what is stamp, what is the value of a stamp? We need to figure out where is the mailbox. Mailbox is my computer. No, how we can put the envelope to the computer? No, 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 no. It's like mission impossible for them. I have observed it uh, with my kids already 10 years ago. And we didn't understand the question, but can you mail the letter? It was too complicated already. They, they understand how to tweet or how to send the email. Even to send email for today's generation is already like out of date business. They are somewhere, they're communicating somewhere else. Well, so you can save 20 minutes. And uh, we have calculated also that every Estonian who is using digital signature can save five working days. It's definitely cumulative calculation, but you can imagine that actually it's a huge amount of money and time what we can save. So it's, it's five working days is 2% of GDP if we calculate it back. So we can be more effective and create 2% more GDP as a nation in general. And actually today we are spending 2% of our GDP for a defense in Estonia. We have some ugly neighbors, so <laughs> we need to do it. So literally we can say that by using digital signature we can afford defense. It is definitely too broad narrative, but uh, more or less there is something that is true also. Well, there is some statistics and you can see that in 2010 we provided 19 million digital signatures and 2015 it was already 66 million digital signatures. So there should be services for it. So it takes time. Even, and I understand that in Panama, digital Panama agenda, there is uh, in high level the, the digital identity and digital signatures issues. So uh, I hope you will all start to use it as soon as possible. But we need to understand that it takes several years until the rollout is complete and the massive use is starting. So if, if somebody will blame somebody that we launched the digital identity and nobody's using it, Please use it, but please also accept it takes a little bit of time. And uh, we made also a very modest calculation that if you save 30, uh, 80 euro cents of what is relevant to a dollar cents per each digital signature, we have saved as a nation already close to 300 million euros or dollars. It's more or less already one fourth of the canal expansion cost, yeah? Or something like it. So you, you can do really a lot of this. Well, now to the services. As explained, if you have strong digital identity, if you have secure data exchange, and if you have data accessible, we can do a miracles. So this is my summer cottage. 
if I'm drinking with my friends or okay, chatting with my friends in my summer cottage, and we got a great idea to establish new company to do a new startup. So we can basically go all online and establish the company. Because there is a business register online and we all have digital identity. So we just need to go to our computers to log in by using our ID card or mobile ID. And uh, when we are getting an application where we can put the data about the name of the company, about what is the uh, capital, what we like to put in, who are the owners, and it all goes digitally, and the checks are going digitally, we can pay the government fee digitally through the banks immediately, and after 15 or 20 minutes, the company is ready. So we can start business. There is no idea to wait until Monday came, and probably we are already having good idea, another good idea, and we need, otherwise we need to wait to go to office, you know, it's a couple of days lost already, so better do it immediately. Basically, you can be on your uh, hiking trip and somebody is calling you and listen, I need to sign the contract with you immediately because I'd like to provide a contract with half a million dollars. What I should do when I'm hiking? In ordinary conditions, I should say that, sorry, I cannot accept it because I'm not available. I cannot come back to the office what is like 200 kilometers away. But in a, if you're having mobile ID and digital signature, you can sign it in your mobile phone and continue hiking and being more or less rich, half a million dollars. I think it's very valuable if you have this kind of access. And you can sign all the contracts and you can see it, how it works. Also, definitely sometimes you need to visit doctor, but sometimes the visit to a doctor is not necessary if the doctor knows you pretty well and probably you need just additional prescribed uh, medicals and you need a receipt for it to get it from a pharmacy. In Estonia, a doctor can do it digitally. So if he or she knows you and you can call him or her, she can provide the uh, recipe to the digital system what is accessible in every pharmacy. So you just need to go to the pharmacy and get the right medicine. And you can follow it in the patient portal, so you can log into the patient portal and you can monitor all the prescriptions that are provided to you, also all uh, doctor's visit, so you can finally understand what doctor write it in your case. First time in your life. <laughs> Even if you see it, you cannot understand it because the doctor's uh, writing style is more or less not understandable for anyone including doctors themselves. Sorry, if there is a doctor inside. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> also, we can go for a voting in Estonia online. And if there is such a heavy snow in the voting day, it might be very much complicated to go for a voting if it's like a couple of, um, a couple of kilometers away. So in Estonia, you can do voting online by using the same digital identity and online voting system, and in last voting, 30% of the votes were cast already online by using the same digital ecosystem. This is strong digital identity, strong registers, and secure data exchanges. So you are not dependent anymore about your location if there is an election day. If there will be elections today in Estonia and I'm in Panama, it will be probably the only option for me to vote online because closest Estonian embassy is in Washington, D.C. And to, to take flight there and back, even if I'm very like convenient citizens and it will cost me $800, I'm not sure I'm doing it. So e-voting system is, is also based to the same, same infrastructure. Or if you're planning to sell your car, you usually need to go to some office, what might be a nice office, no problems. You need to sit there, spend, you know, 30 minutes, an hour to sign all the documents, and when you are new owner of a car or you manage to sell the car. But maybe it's a better option to sell the car when taking bath, because you, do, you can do it also in Estonia online. Because the data about cars is in the digital registries, 
you have strong digital identity and probably another counterpart of a contract is having also a strong digital identity. So basically you can do it all in your computer screen. And uh, just accessing the database about my vehicles, uh, selecting my car, what is actually my car, and, uh, and you can make the transactions, start selling the car to other person, you can pay government service fees also online during this process, and after 10 minutes, uh, the process is complete and you can continue with your path, not waiting in the government office. What's the future? Our understanding about future of the online government is that government as a physical body, at least in the service provision process, is disappearing from the screen, meaning from the physical picture. So we don't, do not need very much any more government offices, front offices. So we can, and the main channel for the citizens will be either, either mobile phone or, or, or tablet or whatever devices screen. And you can get all the services through the screen. But basically, you don't need to do that much because government has your data. Government uh, can automate uh, make it automatic, the data exchange, and government can also warn you if something is expired. So let's say if my driving license is to be expired, government can just send me a message that Mr. Rostock, your driving license is expiring, would you like to renew it? And if I press yes, the government says, that, okay, we mail it to your phone, that's it. Because government has data about you, are you eligible driver? Has a picture about you, because probably I renewed my passport a few years ago. We had my signature if needed. They may access my health record if I uh, accept it. And if I need to do a payment, probably I can give them a right to deduct it for this kind of government services from my bank account. Or they can send a message about it. Or it may be included in this process. So then I, there's no idea to visit any office. And there's no idea for the government to keep running this kind of physical front office anymore. So you just imagine how much people and citizens and businesses, again, can save money by not visiting government office and making government seamless and proactive. Because with a driving license, I think most of you having a driving license, but most of you have no idea when it's expiring because you never take a look to your driving license. It's somewhere in your wallet. And in, a, it's a, in Estonia, it's just the same case. And in most of the cases, when, when the, before this kind of services will appear, and now government just sending us a warning that of, uh, your driving license is expiring and you need to renew it, it was just happening in the way that police stops you in the way and, and telling you that, Mr. Rastok, Sorry, but your driving license has expired already a year ago, so maybe it's now a good time to go to the office to replace it. Because I never take a look to my documents expiring date. Okay, some, sometimes to my passport expiring date, because I, when I'm submitting whatever visa application or airline application, I need to take a look to it. So we need seamless, proactive, and intuitive government. And to get there, we really need a sustainable organization. And as we discussed today in Panama, uh, innovation agency, I think where the organization what is set up there is, is very much meeting the needs. So uh, I, I'm sure there will be really, really great result, results achieved and already achieved. There should be a supportive legislation to accept all those digital transactions. There should be also support from the general public and from the businesses. So you need to demand it from the government. You need to demand from the government similar level of service what you are getting from your banks, what you are getting from airlines, from you are getting from Amazon. The communication with the government should be as simple as you buying something from Amazon. And there is, there is no excuses to any government to provide worse service than in Amazon. It should be intuitive, it should be easy, and, and easily, easily doable, easily accept, uh, acceptable. There should be a great cooperation with the stakeholders. I mean, government, business organizations, universities, and civil society. But the most complicated 
play, uh, thing is definitely change management. Because to change the, change the government procedures, to change the government mind, mindset, it takes time. But, but also here, we, we should be cooperative and uh, discuss the issues between the business communities, between the civil society organizations and the government, what kind of government we need at all. So politicians must understand it also and accept it because citizens want just better services and better governance. And last but not least, in each and every country there should be a political will. And uh, only in the case if there is a political will and, and highest, le highest level leaders of the government, uh, of the presidents or prime ministers, uh, are supporting the process and driving the process we can uh, have a successful results. And we have seen it in many countries, including Estonia, but if there is a real leaders taking care about this process and pushing government and whole society towards the digital society, we can gain really great results and great efficiency, great transparency, and great savings for the whole country. So, to conclude, once again, e-governance is not about technology. It's, it's a set of uh, organizational, regulative, and technological measures. It's not just the hardware and software. And also, uh, the e-governance is reforming and modernizing the whole public administration with ICT tools. It's not limited to the computerization of the government offices. And if it's a nationwide approach, including education, healthcare, social services, transportation, and all what is related to the government, but with a society broader, you can be successful and get a really great results. So thank you very much. I wish good success to Panama, and we really hope to, to see you as digital as Estonia in closest years. Good luck.